Well, good morning, everyone. I realize that I'm between you and the break, and we're a little bit over, so I'll try and hit the highlights here. Um, although I always get, seem to get left with the uplifting triple negative breast cancer talk. Thank you, Jim. So. But I think we are making some progress in this. So what I'm going to cover is um, I put optimal preoperative therapy for patients with triple negative breast cancer. I'm not sure that we know what that is, but at least we can review the data. Management, just a little bit about management of metastatic triple negative breast cancer, and then just talking a little bit about where we're going in terms of molecular profiling these cancers. Um, so I think we're really in the era now where most of us are pretty comfortable considering preoperative chemotherapy for patients with triple negative breast cancer. And one of the things we know and has been shown now in multiple studies is that if you can achieve a pathologic complete response or a near pathologic complete response, these patients really have a, a, quite a favorable outcome. Unfortunately, the converse is also true. If you end up with a lot of residual disease following preoperative chemotherapy, these patients really have a horrible outcome. So this is from a meta-analysis uh, that looked at a bunch of these studies that were looking at neoadjuvant chemo for triple negative breast cancer. And what you can see here is that if you get a PAT-CR, the patients do quite well. If you do not, they do much less well, as you can see, and there was a significant difference there. The problem with this is that if you look at the rate of pathologic complete response in patients with triple negative breast cancer, you only see it in about a third of patients, which means that you're leaving two thirds of patients in this group here, where unfortunately they're probably destined to relapse. And this inherent chemo uh, resistance clearly plays into the poor prognosis that we see with, for patients with this disease. So one of the questions is, you know, since it's so important to achieve a good response rate, how can we do that in patients with triple negative breast cancer? So um, I'm just going to mention a couple of studies here. This is one that you're probably all familiar with. It was presented at San Antonio um, in 2013. And the CLGB40603 study um, was really the first randomized phase two study that looked at preoperative treatment of specifically triple negative breast cancer. So what they did was they took patients with stage two or three triple negative breast cancer and the, the, the control arm was weekly paclitaxel followed by dose dense AC. And then they looked at adding in bevacizumab alone, carboplatin alone, or the combination of carboplatin and bevacizumab with the paclitaxel. The BEV, you can see, was given at 10 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. And the carboplatin, as you can see, was given at, I think, what well, is a slightly strange schedule of an AUC of six every three weeks for four cycles during the paclitaxel. And just to remind you of the data from this trial, this was the secondary endpoint, which is our kind of definition of PAT-CR, which is where there is no invasive cancer in the breast or the lymph nodes, but DCIS is allowed. So what you can see here, they found that the addition of carboplatin to paclitaxel did significantly improve PAT-CR rate from 40% in the control arm up to about more than 50% in the investigational arm, as you can see, and that was statistically significant. In the bevacizumab group, although there was um, an 8% improvement in pathologic complete response rate, as you can see, it didn't, didn't quite meet statistical significance. But as we all know, because I'm sure many of you have actually tried to incorporate this into patients with triple negative breast cancer, what we know is that it's kind of toxic and it's very hard to actually give the dose of paclitaxel that we're given on the study. So if you just focus on this arm here, because really I think most of us are not using bevacizumab in this setting, you can see that the, uh, the neutropenia, greater, grade three or greater, was seen in more than half the patients, and 12% of the patients had febrile neutropenia. What I didn't show here is that obviously this did affect the dose intensity of weekly paclitaxel because you had to hold the paclitaxel because of the, uh, the low neutrophil count. And I would say to you that it's very hard to give this regimen unless you give growth factors. And of course you have to have, get, give GCSF because of the fact that you're giving weekly paclitaxel. You can't give um, peg fill grastrum. So I think overall we would like to add carboplatin to increase the PAT-CR rate in patients with triple negative breast cancer, but because of the toxicity, I think there's, there's definitely some issues with this. And one of the questions is, would other schedules, particularly of the carboplatin, be just as effective? I think a second question is the CLGB study had a lot of correlative studies attached to it, and if we could work out which patients with triple negative breast cancer really need to have carboplatin added, then that would be very useful because you could spare the patients who weren't going to benefit the toxicity of the drug. And then lastly, could, are there other chemotherapy agents that might be just as effective and potentially less toxic? So addressing the first question, this is a, a, um, a relatively small study, Japanese study that was presented at ASCO last year. 
which is kind of a little bit like the CLGB study in design in that the control arm was weakly packed ataxol followed by, in this case, not AC, but CEF, as you can see shown here. Um, and what they did here was, in the investigation arm, they added in carboplatin, but just to point out here, the AUC here was five, not six, and again given every three weeks for four cycles. Now, just to mention here, this is not just triple negative breast cancer. This is HER2 negative breast cancer. So when you look at the PAT-CR rates, keep in mind there were patients with ER positive cancers in this study. Um, and here's the overall um, uh, PAT-CR rates in this study. You can see that overall um, it was improved with the addition of carboplatin. But really, I just want you to focus on the triple negative group shown over here, where the PAT-CR rate was about 45%, so a little tiny, a little bit lower than what we saw in the CLGB study, but still better than what we've seen traditionally. And um, you can see the, her the hormone receptor positive shown here. So you were pretty much maintaining a higher PAT-CR rate. But when you look at toxicity shown here, although there was a high rate of neutropenia, as you can see um, shown here with this more than 50% in the carboplatin arm did have neutropenia, only 2% had febrile neutropenia, as you can see, versus 12% in the CLGB trial. Now, I'm not saying that we should just go ahead and start giving an AUC of five to patients, but I think it does stress the fact that if we're going to incorporate this carboplatin regimen, we do, be do need to be looking at new schedules so that we're able to maintain the, the dose intensity of both the carboplatin and the packet taxon. Now as far as trying to work out is there a group of patients that specifically require or would benefit from the addition of carboplatin to this pacotaxol backbone? Going back to the CLGB study, they've done some very nice work, mainly focused on intrinsic subtyping on the pretreatment samples before patients started chemotherapy. So what they found here was that by far the majority of the patients on their study had basal-like cancers. You can see approaching 90%. And there was a smattering of other groups, as you always see in triple negatives, including like a 2% rate of this Claude and Lowe triple negative group, which I don't think we're quite sure exactly what to make of at this point. Overall, however, when they looked across all the arms, first of all, the rate of, or the, in, the amount of, of uh, basal-like cancers in the forearms is very equivalent. And the PAT-CR rate and the subtype, the overall group, did not differ between the basal-like cancers and the non-basal-like cancers. So basically, just going forward, we're just going to talk about basal-like and non-basal-like in this analysis. Um, looking at uh, the big question we have is, you know, was there any difference with the addition of carboplatin based on whether the cancers were basal-like or, or non-basal-like? The answer was unfortunately no. You can see here in red, in the basal-like cancers, carboplatin did increase the PAT-CR rate, but it also did so in the non-basal-like, as you can see shown here. So overall, the benefit of carboplatin did not vary by subtype. So it would be nice if we knew for sure it was the basal-like so that we're benefiting, but the numbers are small in this, but there's no data right here to suggest that you can kind of avoid carboplatin in cancers that are non basal like In the bevacizumab group, it was kind of interesting. Um, what they found in the basal like group was that there was an increased PAT-CR when you added in bevacizumab to the paclitaxel. Um, however, in the non basal like the patients actually had a lower PAT-CR rate if they uh, did not, uh, if they got bevacizumab versus if they if they did not get bevacizumab, and that actually was a statistically significant interaction. Again, we don't use bevacizumab in this setting, so it's kind of hard to know what we would make of this data. So unfortunately, putting all this together, at least this initial look at, this, at, at the correlative studies in the CLGB study doesn't really tell us that there's a group of patients that maybe benefit more from carboplatin than others. We just don't know at this time point. So lastly, what about other agents? Are there other agents we could substitute instead of the carboplatin paclitaxel that we used? So this is the JEPAR septo study. It's another one of these, the German studies looking at in the preoperative setting. And this slide I know looks very busy, but just to explain it to you for a couple of seconds, the, um, the standard arm is weekly paclitaxel followed by epirubicin and cytoxin. The uh, investigation arm substituted nab paclitaxel for 12 weeks followed by EC with the nab paclitaxel given at 125 milligrams per meter squared as you know, uh, uh, weekly rather. Um, as you know, we do struggle with the weekly dosing of nab paclitaxel, so that's what they essentially chose. Now, this was all comers in terms of subtypes, so they also had HER2 positive cancers included in this. 
Um, and what they did in that group was they added in pertuzumab and trastuzumab to either the paclitaxel or the nab paclitaxel and gave it through the anthracite, as you can see. But there was also a subset of patients that just got the antibodies to start with, either on their own or together, as you can see. So we're not going to talk very much about that today. They didn't really present much on that. So basically, for, uh, from our point of view for triple negative breast cancer, this is comparing paclitaxel prior to EC with nab paclitaxel prior to EC. So the primary endpoint um, is shown here, and what you can see here is that there was an increased PAT-CR rate in the patients who got nab paclitaxel of just under 10%, 29% of the paclitaxel arm, up to 38% in the nab paclitaxel arm. This may look a little bit low, but remember we had ER-positive cancers in here as well, so this is kind of what you would probably see um, uh, in most trials. And then looking at the endpoints according to other definitions, this is our definition of PAT-CR over, right over here, or PAT-CR rather over here, which allows for DCIS. And again, you can see an increase in PAT-CR rate, which was significant. And also if you allowed some disease in the lymph nodes, again, you see this increase in PAT-CR rate. So overall, their primary endpoint was, was met in that nab paclitaxel was superior to paclitaxel. However, where this kind of got interesting is because of when they looked at stratified subgroups that were predefined, what they found was if you look at the biologic subtype based on immunohistochemistry, in the triple negative group shown here, the PAT-CR rate in the standard arm was 26%, was nearly 50% in the patients who got nab paclitaxel, so almost a doubling of PAT-CR rate simply by substituting nab paclitaxel for paclitaxel. Um, the other groups, you didn't really see the same, the other subgroups of, of breast cancer subtypes, you didn't really see the same significance. But if you look down here at hormone receptor status, there was clearly something going on in these hormone receptor negative cancers because the PAT-CR rate was quite high in the nab paclitaxel arm. You may remember the whole SPARC story when nab paclitaxel came out first. Remember, it was felt that cancers that express SPARC may be the ones that potentially benefit most from nab paclitaxel. And they did look at that, but you can see that the PAT-CR rate was higher in the nab paclitaxel arm, whether the cancers were SPARC negative or SPARC positive. Um, if you look at this, the nab paclitaxel group here, although they didn't really talk about this, there was a 10% higher PAT-CR rate with nab paclitaxel in the SPARC positive versus SPARC negative, but I'm not sure that quite met statistical significance, but maybe not time to completely throw SPARC out with the bathwater. Um, as far as toxicity, obviously that's the big issue we have with adding in carboplatin with paclitaxel. Um, for um, hematologic toxicity, just looking at febrile neutropenia here, it was about 4%, 5% in each arm, so better than what we see with adding carboplatin in with paclitaxel. Um, and then, of course, the one that we're always interested in is neuropathy. And um, you can see here, for neuropathy, it was higher in the nab paclitaxel group compared to the paclitaxel group. If you look at three to f uh, grade 3 to 4 neuropathy, it was 10% for nab paclitaxel, 3% for paclitaxel. And this is very in keeping with what's been seen in metastatic studies. So a little bit neuro more neuropathy with the nab paclitaxel. So basically, this is kind of where we are right now. Um, Probably the, the most robust data we have is from the CLGB study because it was a triple negative only study. And it did show that the addition of carboplatin to paclitaxel, to a paclitaxel anthracycline backbone increases PAT-CR rate, both in basal-like and non-basal-like cancers. But the toxicity is a problem, results in decreased dose intensity of the paclitaxel. Specifically, you have to give growth factors. We need to investigate other schedules. And one of the things that I've done, and I'm not recommending that you do this, but it's just something that, that I, I think kind of sometimes makes sense. In patients that perhaps have, you know, these resectable triple negative breast cancers, sometimes what I'll do is give them AC for, for four cycles, assess their response by imaging. If they're having a good response, I might not give them, pack, I might not give them carboplatin. If they're not responding as well as we would like, maybe that they're the group that need carboplatin and paclitaxel. I'm not sure that's the right approach just because the Germans show the kind of tailing treatment in this setting based on response really isn't the, the best approach. But at least if you have somebody, and we do have patients that really have a complete response to anthracyclines, you may be able to avoid carboplatin in those patients. I think substitution with nab paclitaxel is clearly very interesting. The results were quite impressive in that study. Um, but I, at this point in time, I'm not sure that we will get it paid for. So hopefully we'll get more data from this uh, or to support this so that potentially we could use this drug instead. 
So moving on to the metastatic setting. So I don't have to tell you that, of course, we all know that metastatic triple negative is, uh, breast cancer is very aggressive, very high propensity for visceral and brain metastasis a pretty short, uh, a short time after diagnosis. If you look across the trials, the progression-free survival ranges around 6% or so with first-line therapy, and overall survival is in the range of 12 months. Chemotherapy is, of course, the only approved therapy we have, but as I mentioned earlier, there's a probably the majority of triple negative breast cancers that are inherently resistant to chemotherapy. And if they're not, they rapidly require, tend to require resistance to available therapies. I would say at this point, there's no data suggesting that one age is, is better than, than, the, than another in the first line, second or third line settings. We just don't know at this time point. So I just want to mention two trials to you because there's really not too much new in this area. Um, the Aribilin 301 trial, you may remember, was a comparison of Aribilin with Kepcitabine. It was for patients with metastatic breast cancer um, who had to have two or less regimens in the advanced disease setting and had to have a prior anthracycline or taxane. They were randomized to a ribolin given every two, sorry, two weeks out of three or to the kepcitabine given at that kind of rest of the world higher dose than we give here. And the co-primary endpoints were overall survival and PFS. And you remember from this study that the overall, when they looked at overall survival, there was no difference between patients who got aribolin versus patients who got kepcitabine. However, this is a large trial, more than 1,000 patients, and when you look specifically at subtypes, particularly triple negative breast cancer, you see that there actually was a, a significant improvement in overall survival in patients with triple negative bre breast cancer that got aribolin compared to kepcitabine. And the numbers here for the kepcitabine arm, you can see that the overall survival was nine months versus 14 months in the patients who got aribolin. Um, this, you know, there is some concern that triple negative breast cancers are resistant to kepcitabine. I'm not sure I completely buy into this, but I would say that if you're, if you're looking at a patient who's in the second line setting, has had an anthracycline or a ta an taxane or maybe a platinum, you might, when you're thinking about using kepcitabine, you might want to use a ribolin instead of kepcitabine based on this data, because as I say, it's not a huge number of patients, but overall the trial was quite large. And the other trial I wanted to mention, which actually has some pretty interesting aspects to it, is this TNT trial that was presented at the San Antonio meeting. This was a trial for patients with metastatic or, locally uh, or recurrent locally advanced breast cancer that was either triple negative or patients were eligible if they had a known BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Overall, out of the patients that were accrued, 90% of them had triple negative breast cancer with only 10% having BRCA mutations. Um, the, uh, the exclusion criteria were the usual ones we see. Adjuvant taxane within uh, less than 12 months was not allowed. Prior platinums were not allowed. And non anthracytines for metastatic breast cancer were not allowed. And they had these subgroup analysis looking at BRCA mutation, intrinsic subtyping, but also this homologous repair, uh, re re this homologous repair defect that Dr. Whitesell was talking about earlier, which had been shown to be potentially a marker of brca in cells that perhaps were not BRCA mutated, per se, in a pre-op trial that was, was presented by Melinda Telly a few years ago. So patients here either got carboplatin with an AUC of six every three weeks for six cycles as a single agent, or docetax at 100 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks for six cycles. On pro progression, they were able to cross over to the opposite agent, as you can see shown here. So basically, in the just under four, or about the, the 400 or so patients that were randomized, what you can see is looking at response rate, there's no difference between the arms. The response rate was about just around 34, 35% in both arms, not statistically significant. In the crossover component of the trial, the response rates, as you would expect, were lower, but again, no difference between the two arms. And this is very consistent with what we've seen with triple negative breast cancer. It doesn't really appear to matter that much which agents you give them in the first line setting. Progression-free survival, um, again, unfortunately, kind of what we tend to see, you can see here that it was just about five months in the dose of taxon arm, three months in the cover platin arm. No statistically significant difference, as you can see. And overall survival, again, very dismal, what we've seen before, about a year, median overall survival, and again, no difference between the drugs. But one of the nice things about the, this trial was the subgroups that they looked at. So looking, first of all, at the patients who had germline BRCA mutations compared to those that did not. 
um, relatively small number, but uh, supporting other data that has shown this before. In patients who had germline BRCA mutations, the response rate to carboplatin was actually pretty impressive at about 70% versus about 33% in the dose taxol arm. And in patients who did not have germline BRCA mutations, you can see there was no difference in the response rate between the two drugs shown here. So again, this is confirmatory of if you have somebody with a BRCA mutation, a platinum is certainly something that would be reasonable to consider. We go on for our, our trying to seek a way of, of determining BRCA-ness without having a BRCA mutation, this HRD score that I was talking about. The hope would be that this would be a predictor of patients that maybe would benefit more from platinums. And you can see here that, unfortunately, in this study, whether the score was high or low, there was no difference um, in response rate to carboplatin or docetaxel um, in either of these groups that you can see shown here. So unfortunately, we still don't really have a test that can identify these triple negatives that may respond to platinums and perhaps PARP inhibitors um, at this time point. And then the other very interesting thing about this was the intrinsic subtyping. So they just very broadly divide them into basal-like or non-basal-like. And this was very intriguing, I think, indeed. So you can see that most of the patients have basal-like cancers, as I showed you in the CLGB study. In those patients, there was no difference between the carboplatin and docetaxel, as you can see. Maybe we would, we would have expected the platinum to be better, but you can see the response rate was the same. In the non-basal-like, however, very small numbers, there was a very impressive response rate to docetaxel of almost 75% versus about 30% in the carboplatin arm. And when you do the interaction p-value, you can see it is statistically significant. Now, I don't know what this means, but I think it's interesting. And it, it takes us forwards into an area where we need to start thinking about doing molecular profiling to really pick our drugs for patients with triple negative breast cancer. As you all know, this has been taken a step further with the Vanderbilt group, who were able to divide the triple negative breast cancer not just into basal-like versus non-basal-like, but actually into six different subtypes that are all very interesting. And just to very quickly remind you what these are, we have two basal-like um, triple negative subtypes, um, both of which have um, a focus on DNA repair and proliferation genes, but the basal-2 also has growth factor signaling. Then we have amino modulatory subtype, uh, which is driven by genes associated with the gene immune cell processes, a very interesting subgroup since we have so many new agents coming down, they're, they're kind of targeting the immune system. There's two mesenchymal subtypes, the M and the MSL, that, are, um, that have genes associated with EMT processes. The MSL also has growth factor signaling it, and metaplastic cancers fit it in here. And then there is the angin receptor, the luminal angin receptor subtype that has more of a luminal type phenotype and has, expresses angin receptor and downstream genes. So obviously one of the things we want to do is try and subdivide triple negative breast cancers and try and work out targeted treatments for each of these subtypes. But keep Keeping in mind triple negative breast cancer is only 18% of the breast cancers we see, then you're further subdividing it. This is obviously going to require major collaborative effort. Vander, the Vanderbilt group are trying to you know, do, so, do some kind of more targeted approaches to triple negative breast cancer. They're dividing tri metastatic triple negative breast cancer based on whether it's angin receptor positive or angin receptor negative. In the angin receptor positive group, they get an anti-angin plus the PI3 kinase inhibitor that Dr. Gratisher was talking about. The angin receptor negative group gets cisplatin with or without the same PI3 kinase inhibitor, although this part of the trial, I believe, is on hold right now given the, the results that, that Bill showed earlier. But at least this is kind of a movement to where we should be going in terms of treating triple negative breast cancer. And lastly, I think one of the issues that we struggle with is, as I said before, metastatic triple negative breast cancer is so aggressive. I think it's very hard to see activity of a targeted agent in that setting just because you really only have, they usually progress within two to three months or so. So I would um, hypothesize that what we might want to do, and I know there's a lot of interest in this, is focus on patients who have residual disease following preoperative chemotherapy because we know that they're destined to relapse from micrometastatic disease and that this is a group that might be um, a group that might be better served looking at these novel agents and approaches um, versus the patients who have a PATCR who are probably going to do fine. So I think this micrometastatic setting may be a good area to look at these, these new agents. 
Oh, where's my conclusion slide? So just to conclude, um, I think we are making some headway with triple negative breast cancer. In the, I think a lot of us are very comfortable using preoperative treatment. Um, I think the, the, the standard is still AC for, with, with, packlet, with one of the taxanes. Adding carboplatin in, I think, certainly makes sense. The data with NAB paclitaxel is also very interesting. And then the subtyping of the basal-like versus the non-basal-like and the Vanderbilt uh, subtyping hopefully will lead us to you know, more kind of personalized treatment for patients with triple negative breast cancer. Thank you very much.